everyone and welcome to another episode of the Ultimate Supply Chain Podcast. In this edition, we're going to do things a little bit differently. I usually speak to a guest one-on-one to get their views on supply chain matters, but today we're going to benefit from the insights of no fewer than six experts. Recently, we held a roundtable discussion. It was hosted by Marcus Voss, our CIO, COO here at DHL Supply Chain. He was joined by three colleagues from across our business, as well as an industry expert from Boston Consulting Group and one of our wonderful customers. Over the course of this episode, you'll get to hear as the group discusses some of the main issues affecting supply chains today and what we expect to happen as we move through 2023 and into the future. I hope you enjoy it. Good morning, everyone. My name is Markus Voss. I'm the CIO and COO of the DHL Supply Chain Division. And it's my pleasure to host a roundtable today where we'll be talking about the challenges, opportunities, and future trends on supply chain with the specifics of pa- packaging, e-commerce, and also transportation. And we're going to look at the pain points that we have been experiencing on market volatility, over the last couple of months specifically, and and years, I can almost say, we're looking at the peak season developments um, of what we have experienced over the last um, periods, and then also looking at challenges and also future trends um, of what digitalization can do for supply chains. And it's my great pleasure to have an esteemed uh, list of guests today here. And it's my very pleasure to uh, welcome Rainer Stäbler. Um, he is the COO of the HSE, Home Shopping Europe uh, Division, which is um, a, a good uh, partner of DHL. Thanks, so we thank you for joining us. Thanks, pleasure to be here. And to my left, uh, we have Markus Weidmann. He is a partner and managing director at the Boston Consulting Group. Been working with them, he works with um, esteemed guests and clients from many industries, but particularly on supply chain planning and logistics. Thanks so much for having me. And then we start with our DHL colleagues, um, female first, uh, Tia Wallace. Um, uh, Tia is leading our business development efforts and, and is the VP um, of e-commerce and in our e-commerce uh, part of the business. Welcome, Tia. Pleasure. Thank you. Great to be here. And then Mark Patterson, um, VP of Global Packaging. Uh, welcome to our round table. Thanks, Marcus. Good to be here. L- last but not least, uh, on the far left for me, Alistair Shooter, the Global Head of Transport for DHL Supply Chain. Hi, Marcus. Great to be here. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. And really welcome. And thanks for joining me in this round table. So let's start um, with uh, looking at peak. Uh, we're just behind uh, one of the major, I guess, uh, periods where we have experienced peaks, uh, the holiday season, um, Black Fridays. And um, Reiner, maybe you can start with an overview on HSE uh, for, for our um, listeners here. HSE is since more than 27 years uh, expert in, we call it live shopping. Yeah. I think um, historically, for sure, live shopping was always on television. Yeah. Uh, but if you now look to China, then China is already uh, experiencing a very strong trend in live shopping in e-commerce because 25% of the overall e-commerce revenue is driven by live shopping. So that's why we think we have a very good starting position in that business also for the future in, in Europe. We are a dedicated company which, which is really um, performing live shopping and 90, more than 90% of our assortments is own goods or private goods, so we are we have the full supply chain, uh, and yeah, historically we have a very very strong partnership with DHL. I think in many many touch points, you're running our own and big uh, warehouse facility. Uh, we have I think the the very beneficial position that we are completely or directly linked to our to your parcel hub, so we have a straight connection with the conveyor belt. Also, when you look into ESG and a lot of other things, which we are which will challenge us in the future. I think we have a very strong position in this partnership together with you. When you talk about peak, perhaps we are a bit different because we have not these huge peaks. We are driven by 24 seven live shows. Yeah. And our strongest month is October, which is a bit before because that's when we celebrate our birthday. 
Um, and then we have, a, we have a, a more, yeah, not so strong peak business than the other ones. And I think that's perhaps also a benefit of, of our customer base and our business. So you always have peak, you always have to manage the, the challenges. Yeah. And that's a bit the difference we have here. Yeah. So you're working also then kind of on the internet side with influencers when they're exactly. starting to... Exactly. So our business model is a lot about having special assortment, which you only get at HSE, combined with celebrities. I think everybody knows Judith Williams or Thomas Rath. Uh, and for that reason, we have a very strong fan base and we are impulse driven. So you're not buying by at HSE. If you search for something, it's more about we are inspiring you for shopping. Yeah. And are you able then to completely flatten out the, the demand um, in the supply chain? We would love to, <laughs> yeah. But I think the difference is really, we sell fashion. We also sell high-priced jewelry. We sell, uh, we can sell everything, yeah. We sell household goods, wellness, beauty. So the whole range, but you can imagine from a logistical point of view, it's also very challenging because you have to manage a 5,000 euro bracelet and on the other side, um, a 50 euro cosmetic or, or hanging garments. Yeah. So for logistics, it's really challenging, but also for our call centers, it's sometimes challenging. You can imagine selling jewelry, you get not so many calls for orders. And if you spend the next hour selling cleaning products, we have a lot of people calling in. So that's the, the reason why we need a lot of flexibility and variety. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rainer, so far. So, Marcus, then moving on to um, a broader range of customers that you are dealing with, what, how are they experiencing peak? And have you seen, especially in the 2022 season, have you seen any particular, uh, I guess, new trends that, that you uh, could detect? Yeah. So, uh, as a partner, I'm working across industries at BCG, serving clients in automotive, pharma, retail, consumer, many others have the privilege, can enjoy those industries, uh, basically looking into their supply chain. And if you look at the peak in in this year, it was a different peak than the last years, because uh, often you had the challenge in the past years, I mean, getting out the volumes, causing stability. This year, you often had the situation, you were looking into warehouse inbound and the pallet was missing because it didn't arrive. So uh, due to the constant supply crisis that, that we see, um, basically the stuff, the availability that we were used to in past years and decades isn't anymore given. Yeah? So we're missing pieces. And so what we see clients at the moment doing is um, especially, I mean, to enable the front end of logistics, bringing out the volumes you need to have the good on your hands. So they want to create much more transparency in the back end of supply chains. So the key word is multi-tier a supplier transparency, understanding who is my supplier, who is the supplier of my supplier, and going further down the chain. I think that is a really new thing people are looking into, into this new level of transparency, understanding where is actually the stuff coming from, because somehow it wasn't there sometimes this Christmas season. Ensuring that there is no single sourcing that potentially could be uh, uh, impacted by any type of disruptions. Okay. So looking at our own DHL operation, maybe I start with Mark and, and your specialty is packaging and packaging obviously also then in peak and in e-commerce is a big topic for our customers. So what have you seen? I think what's really interesting about packaging is our peaks are at a slightly different stage as the traditional peak. So you take the holiday season, you'll find that the peak season for us is actually in the summer period where we're actually bringing a lot of our packaging business to life and, uh, and doing a lot of that preparation you know, in anticipation of the peak that will come through in the holiday season. So for us, it's about flexibility. It's about flexing our labor, but also flexing our operations through the summer period, building up to the peak, which for us will be October, November, going into the holiday season. Uh, and for us, as part of that flexibility is also about supply. And, and taking your point, Marcus, about, uh, about the supply challenges we've had from a packaging perspective, raw materials and materials that we've been needed, needed to fulfill that has also been a challenge um, and, and ensuring that we've got that supply and single source of supply is a great, a great challenge as well. And it's our agility in the marketplace to be able to find suppliers and to be able to work with our customers to ensure we can keep that continuity um, throughout the peak season. And certainly when we, we, we talk a bit later about you know, automation and digitalization, that's a real key part of um, the future for us, which we can go into. When I listen to this, Alistair, it looks like there has been a lot of demand for your services that you're overseeing transport. If we are having issues of having the right uh, products in the warehouse, then I guess everybody's looking at you to see, okay, where, where where are the trucks? When are they arriving? So what have you seen on peak? 
It's a really interesting topic, picking up on some of the discussions we've had here. I mean, change, change is a constant thing, right? What we really benefit from at DHL is our scale. So our customers have fundamentally a simple requirement. They want their goods to be delivered on time at the, at the price they expect and uh, to have that level of visibility. And I think what we can really live, leverage as our business is that network capability. So bringing together that collection of customers. So Rhino was talking about his business they have a, a different type of peak requirement to other ones in our portfolio. So if you compare that to an automotive customer, you're going to see a different effect to a retail customer. So the benefit we can have is really to leverage that together and then offer that as one complete network solution to really utilize our scale. I think that's a really key thing. And then building on that, it's around the change we see in the industry, as I mentioned, the different trends of consumers moving to a more direct-to-consumer model and we need to be much more reactive to, to wait the direction that it's going. Okay, so um, Tia, um, we have seen during the pandemic a huge boost in e-commerce and everybody was ordering like crazy. Um, but then in 2022, I've heard that some of that was plateauing a little bit. Is that what you've been seeing or what, what is the trend in e-com? Really interesting. So we see a continued uptake in the online channel even with some of the headwinds that we're facing into in terms of economic factors, cost of living crisis, inflation, we do see consumers continuing to engage with the online channel. So from a logistics and supply chain perspective, <clears throat> the focus continues to be on flexibility to cope with that, but also some of the emerging trends around personalization of product, of packaging mean that there are other complexities that we also need to be able to handle within our solutions as well. And as ever, the need for a robust and reliable final mile network. So we've seen changes in the way that retailers are approaching the online channel through peak seasons. Actually, some retailers completely doing away with the Black Friday promotional period altogether, and actually with some great successes in a number of areas. So smoothing their own demand by a higher level of controlled promotional activity, working with influencers, working with partners to drive that demand. But of course, there is always that unexpected demand. The, the behavior, as we know, of the influencers and celebrities that we work with may be unexpected. So really looking at how do we continue to stay tuned in to that social commerce influence and the ability to flex up and down remains really critical. All of that then combined with our need to be able to retain, attract and retain high quality labor, of course. Looks like uh, the data um, is going to be a topic that we'll touch upon a little bit later. It's an important part of, of managing that overall uh, supply chain more effectively. But maybe let me just very briefly then move on to a slightly different topic. Once now that we have the right product at the right location and the customers are calling in and they're, they're buying it and we're able to transport it in the right place and it's packaged nicely, I guess there is always the, the, the possibility that things are being returned. Reiner, is that an area that you are focusing on, returns management? I think as costs are increasing, uh, returns are getting more and more important. Yeah. And also from a, I think from an ESG point of view, we all want to reduce and we have to reduce returns as much as possible. And I think the best way, and it's how we are approaching it, starting at the beginning to explain the product better to the customer. Um, I think we have the benefit that we can explain the product in the live shows to, to, to tell them, especially when we talk about fashion. I think the high returning areas which we have is fashion and, and jewelry. So we have to explain much better, but you also have to work on your digital um, touch points like our app or our, our web shop. Uh, and that's the starting point here. Yeah. On the other side, where we really work is also to make the process for the consumer very convenient. Um, and I think that was a bit of a challenge for us in 2022, where we had all these delays from Asia, because usually we sell the products more times. So when the returns coming back, we're looking at the good products, then we bring it back to the next stage shows. And as if that chain is a bit destroyed, then you lose sales cycles. That was challenging 2022. But for us, it's really important that we have a also a very fast return process that we are able to bring the product as soon as possible back into sale. Because as sooner as, as you have the product, you're still in the, in the season 
and not already in the next season where you have to make big markdowns. Yeah, I think that's important, yeah. Very good. So, Tia, you've seen many uh, different industries, obviously, as well. Returns, is that a topic for all of them? A huge topic. If we if we take the fashion sector example, um, we continue to see that the returns rate for the online channel is double that of what it would be in store, so averaging at around the 20% mark still. Really interestingly, talked about speed of returns process. Some of the research that DHL supply chain has been doing with our customers has shown that we actually also can reduce the returns rate with faster fulfillment in the first instance. So the quicker that a consumer can have the product in their hand, in their wardrobe in the first instance, the less likely they are to have buyer's remorse. So there's a lot of data that we're starting to generate that can help us to understand how we can influence that returns rate. The other factor as well, as you spoke about in terms of that consumer consciousness about their environmental impact, we're also seeing an increased need for distributed networks. If there is only maybe one or two fulfillment locations within a European market, we're noticing that consumers are increasingly concerned about the impact of sending product back to the hub. So more and more of our customers are looking for that distributed European network solution from us. So. Yeah, huge topic and lots that we can do again with the data that we're starting to generate. And then uh, Mark and Alistair, anything that you want to add on the returns end of things? I think from a returns perspective, I think the packaging side of it is is really about how we can reuse packaging as much as possible. So taking the sustainability uh, angle to it, but it's also speed back into the network and how quickly can we turn that product back into stock, availability to be reordered. Um, so the, the amount of rework that is needed and, and the work that we're doing around repackaging um, and reuse of, of, of that material is, is really important. But then it's also about making sure that the integrity of the product is kept, that we're doing a lot of, um, of that screen testing, ensuring that the product is of the quality that our customer expects, that we can get it back in quickly enough. Um, ensuring that it hasn't been tampered with, that you know there's no uh, there's no um, uh, counterfeiting or any fraud that may happen around those products, um, and make sure that gets into stock as quick as possible. I mean, I really like the point that Reiner made about the focus being on the end consumer and the experience that they have. You know, people fundamentally, when you order something online, you want to return it, you want to get it back as quickly as easy as possible. You for sure don't want to have to pay for that. You have sustainability concerns as well, so you want to make sure that's done in the proper way and it, it needs to be smooth, right? So that's how we're looking at it as a business to, to tackle it. I think that's extremely important. And then from the, at the actual um, the shipper's point of view, it's getting that product back into their supply chain with, and decide what you want to do with it, recondition it, put it back into, in, into retail channel and off you go. So that's really the process that we're seeking to enable. So we've been talking about um some of the pain points, some of the challenges we've seen in peak. But there's also a solution that I think uh, we all have been talking about, and that would be digitalization. And in DHL supply chain, we have been focusing a lot on, on identifying the things that are enabling our customers in utilizing digitalization to address some of the pain points we were just been talking about. So we focused on 12 core technologies that we felt are ready for mass deployment. You could digitalize in many different things, and we've all seen failed digitalization of things which are interesting to have, but really didn't really um, add anything neither to the bottom line or didn't improve speed or didn't take away any unnecessary tasks. So it's important to focus on things that actually do work. So we have, for example, in the e-commerce space, um, looked a lot at assisted picking robots. It's significantly enhancing this the speed in which picks are happening. And I'm sure uh, our viewers have seen um, the bots which are running around many of our facilities. In the meantime, we have had more than 4,000 of those bots deployed in our um, warehouses, which is by far the biggest fleet that you can find in the logistics of operations. And we have also seen that we are having an increased accuracy. So um, it is very easy to do. Any of us, I can, get, I can, um, I promise you I could train a person in 10 minutes uh, to be an effective picker in any of our locations. So that's something, especially in peak, is something which we felt is very important uh, because you need to train a new uh, operative very quickly and make this um, task much more enjoyable or at least not as strenuous 
as what we have seen before with lots of walking distances. So it does lead to reduced lead times. Uh, we have uh, ability to drive much more um, efficiency in the warehouse and do this with significantly lo a lower amount of people. So that is something where we have done now and we have surpassed 200 million picks assisted by bots. And I think this is just going to continue. It is collaborative. We're seeing a significant improvement in terms of the employee engagement. We're measuring, um, as probably anyone would do, also the satisfaction that our employees and associates have when they are dealing with these type of technologies. And we're significantly seeing that there is much more um, engagement that we're seeing in sites where we deploy. And, and that's why it's very important to have in every site we have this technology deployed and that we're seeing then also the results of it. But it does also then help to drive digitalization in the sense that we have more data. You can see much better of where a certain uh, reshuffling of the goods needs to happen, where maybe we can do better in terms of um, slotting um, or um, and ensuring that we do the cycle counts in areas where we have a much higher degree of, um, of, of errors that otherwise will occur and then lead to rework and, and things which are not considered as a happy flow. So data analytics and digitalization, in my mind, goes, goes really hand in hand and, and it is all about scale, scale, scale. So Marcus, at BCG, uh, you're working uh, a lot with customers across um, digital supply chains. Where are you seeing focus areas to apply digitalization effectively and successfully? Yeah, I, I must say, um, I mean, if I if I visit clients today and operate in their supply chains, you know, I'm a consultant. I'm a big fan of of, of Excel. Yeah, so I use it day to day or the PowerPoint. But um, basically, I see in supply chains far too much Excel. Still, so, and and uh, you have to move to a new level of digitalization, and you can't really say that in there is a specific area. I see really every area lagging still from warehousing, from transport planning, from uh, basically material planning in in uh, in the supply chain. So there is an there is really a fundamental upgrade of this needed. Yeah, uh, so you see still too many people working in Excel trying to capture this environment and and working on it. And the, the problem is basically with the volatility that we have now seen in recent years and recent months, this is not anymore possible. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to manage 70,000 SKUs or something like that in an Excel, basically, uh, and especially iterated then at the same time with the sales department and others. I think this digitalization, which is there, like bringing the warehouse to a digital level, the planning around it, the transport and so on, I think DHL will play a super critical role. As you have shielded in the past clients, um, basically from labor scarcity on some occasions, yeah? uh, now is your role basically to help your clients uh, to digitalize. Um, and I think this is really critical because not everybody can reinvent the wheel on their own. Yeah? So they will need somebody to the clients of yours or the customers will need somebody um, they can go to to help in their digitalization because they have a lot of other business areas also to digitalize. They have to also look into marketing. They also have to look into, uh, let's say, sales, finance, and so on. And so they're looking for partners to help them in uh, the logistics space uh, because it's one of the areas where they have to work on. Uh, they don't have endless resources. And so I think you could take a really critical position in bringing this to, to as many customers as possible and enabling them to digitalize. The enemy has moved from paper to yeah. Excel. Yeah, <laughs> but it's really hard to get the Excel out of uh, out of the processes. Believe me. Very well, very good. Okay, so Alistair, um, for transport, you get the order, you do it. Is data important for you? Yeah, I think that absolutely super important. And as you know, Marcus, it's all about the quality of that data and what you actually do with it. And I think Marcus uh, talking there about using Excel, you know, that still does happen a lot in the logistics industry. And I think as an industry, we have been slow to to adopt uh, new technology and really innovate. And that's really changing now. You can really see that. And uh, our customers are coming to us to say, I, I want to digitalize my supply chain to make it more effective. How can you help me to do that? So I think what we really need to do is understand that it, it it's looking at that whole process. Digitalization touches and may influence every step of that. So you take that holistic view and then really look at where the opportunities lie. And that's what we're able to do in our process uh, and how we look at transportation in DHL. 
and then really focus on where are the big opportunities, where can we build those use cases and where can we apply them to be most effective. And that's where we've seen some really good examples of delivering success. Um, be that simple things like very manual tasks, for example, processing of uh, proof of de delivery documents, using uh, robotic automation to do that, uh, monitoring, providing visibility, all that kind of stuff. You, you can do that with digitalization, but I think the key topic is really focusing on the right things. And now that you mentioned there's a very fascinating new technology we're deploying of completely doing this unloading of trailers uh, with robotic support as well, which is a very, very heavy and, and, uh, and also repetitive tasks that I think many, many of our associates uh, do not particularly like, but where we have now um, new solutions which are bringing to the market, which are, which are going to be very important in the, I guess, linkage between transport and the warehouse then itself. And I think that's a key point as well, right? Because um, it, it, you could perceive a lot of this efficiency gain as, as a threat to, uh, to organizations, but you know, we have a, we have a labor shortage, right? So this is all about making us more lean, more effective in that, in that regard as well. And the other thing data for you is to do what I always say is to eliminate that crime to ship air, right? Tia, on the e-commerce side, I mean, we talked about fluctuations, volume fluctuation, biggest enemy, I guess, in driving efficiency um, in, in our operations. So how can our customers use digitalization to respond better to those volume fluctuations? Technology deployments work best when it's about bringing the technology and the people together. So it's a huge part of our agenda with our customers is how do we bring those deployments into the warehouse environment to cope with the peak volumes. But also it's about creating a working environment that is more appealing and that helps us with that direct labor challenge that we have. So actually, if we can offer more and more warehousing environments that are digitally led, technology led, it is also helping us to attract a wider demographic of labor who are more used to interacting with devices, it reduces the training cycle time for those colleagues by making it a much more intuitive and interactive experience, but also, of course, generating really, really valuable data to help us to refine and develop those solutions um, during the implementation and the life of the contract. So as well as helping us to deal with the peak fluctuations, it is critically important to our people agenda going forward as well. Mark, can you help me to use data to make packaging a less terrible when you have packages arriving at your home and you see that a very tiny little item is is arriving in a huge parcel oh the fantastic horror stories and uh, and i'm sure over the holiday season everyone would have received a package with a tiny component with a huge amount of void fill and, and wrap and some of that not even sustainable either so for us it's around the optimization of that and, and within our e-commerce Packaging environments is bringing in tools like OptiCartin, optimizing using algorithms, using volumetrics to actually really understand and helping our, our colleagues, um, you know, at the pack stations to select the right uh, box with the right, um, with the right uh, consumables that go into that. It's about grouping orders as well, where best we can. Um, so that's really important. And I think the other side of it as well is around where we can use digitalization to work alongside our colleagues. Um, and you know, just a great statistics uh, from the, from this peak season, um, we we packed over sixty million chocolates into holiday advent calendars. The majority of that was done through robotics, working alongside our colleagues, and the repetitive nature of putting those chocolates into each one of those um, uh, compartments um, is challenging for an individual. But for a robot, it works alongside, and really, you know, we saw the the the, the benefits from that. So working alongside, looking at, uh, you know, assisted pick robots, looking at um, uh, auto palletizers at the end of our packaging lines is really just helping. And it's taking a lot of those tasks that many of our colleagues don't enjoy doing and passing that on to somebody who uh, is going to turn up every day. Um, and, you know, really from a labor shortage perspective, really help us. So some fantastic developments in equipment within packaging for, for this year ahead, which is going to be really exciting. And we're seeing some of those solutions where the carton is being cut right to the size of the product, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, we've got a couple of really good uh, um, uh, implementations at the moment where we're using that technology. It does require volume um, because they are not cheap assets. 
So the higher volume you have, you're going to really get that repetitive motion. But the fact that you are, you know, you're cutting the box around the product, um, sealing it and dispatching it straight away um, is not only speed, but it's also environmentally friendly in terms of the less void fill that's needed, um, but does does require volume um, to, to really justify it. So Reiner, I orchestrated the discussion a little bit to trigger some ideas of what could be relevant. But honestly, in the end, it is you, the customer, who decides what is important for HSE. What do you want to deploy and where can we help you? So hopefully you're picking up some of the ideas. But honestly, I want your, I want your true answer of where is the focus of what you're driving. Uh, yes, this, 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 these things are all very, very interesting for us. We at the moment rolling out the Locus robots. I'm sure you're aware about that. Yeah, But at the end, I think we are in a beneficial situation. We have a lot of data. I think all the questions, we know everything of our customers. We have 70, 97% of our customers are repeat customers. So we have really a lot of data. It's more about how we can use the data. Yeah. The other benefit we have is I know exactly which products we will sell the next coming days because it's all on our TV schedule, on our live stream schedule. Yeah. So we are now more and more working together with DHL very close that we discuss upfront. These are the products which will be relevant the upcoming weeks and Often we, we are matching our forecast, but sometimes the future is a bit different. But then at least, but if you can, can predict 80%, it's a lot where you can optimize the warehouse. But I think we all have to continuously work and it's for sure the environment, which is also a big argument to improve and to invest. But on the other side, it's also helping us bringing the costs down. And we have to be, when we talk about home shopping, we have to keep our cost under control. Otherwise we cannot ship products under a certain euro level to the end consumers anymore. So shortage uh, of labor will continue. I think that's, that's clear. So if you want to keep our service level, if you want to keep the prices under control, there is no alternative. What I like on the Locus robots and also on Box on Demand, which we are also investigating at the moment is, it's also, it's equipment which keeps us also the flexibility. What I don't like is investments for the next 10 to 15 years because I, at the moment it's so difficult to predict what will happen in 10 years. Do we still sell 50% fashion or perhaps we sell 50%, uh, I don't know, wellness and, and beauty. I think that's a big difference here. Yeah. And I think having a, the flexibility of investments, but a very high automation that helps us a lot. That's what I like here. Yeah. I don't like the big investments or commitments for the next 10 years. Yeah. I think this is indeed also how, how we in DHL are seeing this. The collaborative robots are are very much reusable. And if you in HSC need 100 bots, or we have in one of our operations, we had we had more than f 500 bots in one location, but it is for a period of time. And then maybe there's another customer who needs the same bots, but at a different time in the year. And that flexibility is very important uh, rather than having an asset which sits around and is not utilized to its full extent. Everyone has peaks at different times. So some of the equipment can be moved. And from a packaging perspective, we do that as well, where we move to, to meet the peaks of our customers. And look, if I look at our business, you know, there is a fashion season. So there are a few weeks where you have a lot of fashion and then there is jewelry. So I always, when I look at the productivity of the different areas, they are not so high but I need to have the capacity for the peak times. Yeah. And if I have technology and robots, which are helping me managing the peak times, also running three shifts without problem. Yeah. I think that is, that is very beneficial. Yeah. Reusable technology is, is definitely a, a good answer to, to some of those volatilities. All right, so uh, we've talked about some of the pain points. We talked about some of the solutions which are available to us. But let's now look at a little bit into the future. Um, 2023 is obviously just started, uh, but we all have to think, okay, what, what comes beyond? What is What are the solutions and what are the ideas for the supply chain of the future? Maybe I'll start again with you. What is HSE thinking in terms of developments that you are preparing for and that you would like to focus on? So our major, because I always come from the customer and operation has to follow. Yeah, that's our position. Yeah. So um, for sure, the, the traditional TV commerce business will grow 2% on a yearly basis. But for us, the big thing is bringing the business into the digital world. So following the Chinese trend that live shopping, we have just launched an app um, 
and other things that we really have much more people making live shows because at the moment we have two, three TV channels. If I go on the app, I can run a thousand shows in parallel with no limitation. So that's the, 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 the strategic focus which we are pushing at the moment. What does that mean for the operational side? I think I will have much more different assortments, much more different SKUs, perhaps smaller quantities. So that's also something where operation has to follow. And that's the reason why I need to invest in automation. There's no way around. The next big thing is, I think, also from a consumer point of view, the whole ESG topic. We have to bring our parcels smaller. We can't afford shipping so much air to our customers. They don't like that. Yeah. We are also collecting at the moment every order which coming in in one day we collect so that we don't send you two or three parcels, that we only send you one parcel. I think these are the areas where we are looking and keeping the flexibility because it's difficult to predict what will be the situation in five years there. Yeah. And only send DHL parcel carriers so that there, there's not three deliveries at the same household. Exactly. <laughs> so I think if there would be one who could consolidate at the end, big benefit there. Yeah. We're happy to do so. <laughs> <laughs> to your competitors, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Marcus, um, again, looking at also other industries, other customers, what are you seeing? What, what, what are they working on? What is the trends that we should, as DHL, also be prepared yeah. or what we will be asked? I, I think, I mean, we are just coming out of this, uh, let's say, crisis uh, in 2023, 2024. Let's not get used to the idea that it's all going back to the old days. Um, I think uh, we like to call it the new supply chain normal, basically, um, so that we have in the supply side also the volatility still uh, remaining on a high level. And so I think uh, some of the trends that will then beyond this managing the current uh, availability topics and uh, keeping your head uh, above the water, uh, then more mid to long term, there's three topics coming, two of those we, we already mentioned. Uh, you said the uh, ESG topic, respectively sustainability is a big uh, topic. We talked about digitalization and automation and analytics is a big topic. I would add a third one, which is uh, resilience. Yeah, So making the supply chains more resilient. And so if, if I were to, to make a roadmap basically about my supply chain operations, I would always take in, I mean, the classics of cost, service, quality uh, that I would bring, but I would also say, okay, what do I do on digital and analytics what and, and automation, including what do I do on sustainability and what do I do on resilience? And then say, okay, what are my actions there? What do I have to do as homework in the next years? Yeah. Okay. So if I hear what uh, Reiner and Marcus are saying, at least we are on the on the right trend in DHL. What we are investing in, and what most of my own or personal time is invested in, is data. Uh, utilizing data much more. We have we're sitting on a on a huge amount of data, but it is um, obviously across all industries. It is not yet in a uniform fashion in many respects. So that's something where we are investing into analytical products as well as data products and building an infrastructure uh, that is helping us to make more use of data. Then second is then utilizing that data and building a digital twin. Um, it's obviously a bit of a buzzword that has been in the industry for quite some time. Um, but to be honest, I've seen some amazing examples, particularly in manufacturing. We were chatting about this before. I think there is a huge opportunity to drive inefficiencies out of logistics as well by utilizing a digital twin. How nice would it be if we can, at any moment in time, oversee what is the next most important task that needs to happen? What is the next shipment that needs to uh, gonna get to the door and in order to not miss any cutoff times to, to deliver to the server level agreements that our customers are expecting? And then obviously it all goes hand in hand with the investment that we're driving on sustainability, carbon emissions, and also then achieving the science-based target is more and more on the forefront of topics that, that I'm seeing our customers are asking for. We have pledged that we're investing 7 billion euros into um, our operations um, until 2030 to achieve the science-based target. It is in many respects, a, a huge endeavor that we have been embarking on because sometimes the technology isn't even there and we have to make some uh, leap of faith in order to drive this. So these are the core themes, uh, data, analytics, um, a digital twin, as well as, well as sustainability, which I think are, are very important for the years to come 
that we are making co considerable progress over time. So Tia, what are the themes that you are hearing from e-commerce customers? Yeah, so in summary, as we spoke about earlier, even with some of the uncertainty around consumer spend, we see online continuing to be the channel that grows. So some of that is through retailers actually looking to create a frictionless experience for consumers where the store operates as more of a showroom environment, but the actual fulfillment of demand is managed through the online channel more and more. And also the demographics. So the, the consumers of tomorrow are very much used to engaging on digital channels, online devices. What that means for us, um, we were already thinking about peak as a all year round focus within DHL supply chain. So a continual cycle of taking lessons learned, looking at flexible solutions to enable us to cope with fluctuations in demand throughout the year. So I think we're really well positioned to deal with some of these changes in the way that the volume is materializing throughout the year. Critically, that ability, particularly where we're working with collaborative robotics for us to flex both up and down in terms of the movable assets that we can share between different operations, as well as sharing our colleagues and the skill set that we're building with these new digital technologies. Great. Ellis, you're my partner in crime because it's when we look at sustainability, more than 90% of our emissions in the shell supply chain is in the space of transport. Yeah. We can do as much as we want on warehousing. Yeah. It's probably not going to turn the needle. So what are, your, what are your focus areas? I mean, this is obviously, we're at a point now, Marcus, where customers are coming to us more and more uh, with requirements around this. And we're seeing a tipping point as well uh, in terms of willing to make that investment in favor of, of reducing costs. So I think that's really good to see that, you know, people have that responsibility towards their end consumers and that they want to be able to do the right thing. So we're, we're positioning ourselves to be able to deliver those solutions. As you said, it, the various markets have different uh, types of technology that we're able to de deploy. And I think that's what we're really able to offer is that expertise in our scale to really um, provide the most appropriate solution. So whether that be a different type of vehicle that's burning a different type of fuel, but also looking at things like modal shift as well. So moving away from moving things by road, using rail, you have to consider the service impact of that, but also the, the emissions benefit as well. And I think what we're seeing more and more is that customers are much more open as well to, to collaborating with one another that can also give that benefit. So previously, you may not have wanted to put your goods on the same vehicle as another or in the same warehouse. I think that that's moving now and that's changing. The other thing I'd like to touch on, uh, I think Tia really well articulated that the trends of our customers. I think um, when we look forward, the, the big challenge we have, particularly in transportation, is around our ability to service that and having the resources. And we've talked a lot about technology and trends. Fundamentally though, we're, we're a people-based company and what we're really focused on is making DHL an attractive company to work for, uh, letting people know that you can come here in the environment that we offer, the flexibility we can offer to people. That's also something we're really focused on, for our, particularly for our drivers, because we, we need people to make our business tick. If you were a betting man, what is the technology you would be putting all of your dollars on? Well, I'm not really a betting man. Um, <laughs> <It's the word. laughs> but I, I think... I, th I think the technology around obviously alternative drives, alternative fuels for vehicles is really uh, the way that, that things are going. But actually it's the ability to oversee that and orchestrate that in an effective way. So um, yeah, deploying technology to actually manage that supply chain at the very high level to make sure that you have full visibility of all of your assets is really the key thing. Sorry for putting you on the spot, but I'm sure our listeners are very keen on hearing some of the edgy statements here. Very good. Mark, data and visibility, are these trends that you need to know and, and, and packaging as well and then environmental? I think we touched a little bit on this. Is that an area of focus for 2023, four or five in packaging? Yeah, very much so, Marcus. I think um, I think when we look at it, there's two parts I'd, I'd want to cover here. One is from a data perspective, it's actually looking at the end-to-end -end supply chain. And when we look at packaging, we can't just look at it in isolation. And I think the same when we look at transportation, e-commerce, it can't be looked in isolation of the full supply chain. The fact that you can make decisions around packaging that can optimize your load capacity, that means you can have less vehicles on the road, is a sustainably 
positive outcome, but is also reducing the amount of labor we might need in, in having the number of drivers. It may allow us to have a better service into our customers. So for me, you know, a lot, in, and I think Marcus, you also said um, uh, around resilience. Resilience is a really key factor for us for this year because we've come out of the COVID you know, period. We're, we're still seeing that our, our supply chains are under a huge amount of pressure the amount of control we can have on that supply chain. And for a good example around bringing packaging operations under the same roof as our warehousing operations, restricts that movement of product out and back in again, um, which again, help, helps with that resilience, but also helps with cost, labor planning, and, and really smoothing that peak out as much as we can, because we can shift labor where we can. And then the, the, the final area would be around sustainability, um, a massive, massive uh, focus for packaging. Um, not only are we looking at um, as much um, more sustainable consumables and susta sustainable materials that we're using, which is very much a given at the moment, everyone's looking at um, how we can um, bring that to life, but more about also about reusability, about bringing product in that we can send out and bring back. From an e-commerce perspective, that's a challenge because you're sending out a product and you say, you know, it's going out in a reusable container, we want the container back. Challenging, in closed loop networks, that's a lot easier but that's something we're really looking at. But in certain industries like our life science industry, we're now converting a lot of our um, outbound shipments into reusable containers that are going out and coming back. And the results are fantastic. We're seeing a 98% return rate, which is just, you know, in the market is, 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 is really impressive. So the more we can focus on that, we'll drive our sustainability targets, um, but also bring a, a, a customer experience that I think is second to none. Very good. Reiner, I, I hope you feel in good hands with DHL. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for your views. It's been a fascinating short discussion that we have uh, orchestrated today here. Some, some great views on where the industry is going, where some of the challenges are, but also solutions which are available to us. So thank you so much. It will be important uh, to continue to drive the industry um, and to take it into kind of the next era. And while I mention that, the, there is a, a great opportunity to connect with thought leaders, decision makers, and industry leaders and in an event that we are orchestrating and that we are organizing in Valencia in Spain by, from the uh, 25th of April to the 27th of April, which has the title of the Era of Sustainable Logistics. So many of the topics we covered here today will be showcased, will be demonstrated there and decisions uh, are, are going to be also started to be implemented. So um, things that uh, definitely also I'm sure um, our viewers are very interested in. So look it up on the internet um, and maybe get yourself invited and, 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 and be part of driving the industry um, into the next phase. And if you want to learn more about the trends that we have been talking about here, as well as many things that are uh, broadcasted in, in similar events that we are driving from DHL as well, is the logistics trend radar. So something that you can download, there's a, there's a paper-based version, but more importantly, there is a interactive and a digital version available uh, on our website, uh, the logistics trend radar 6.0. So it's just a six edition already um, of this uh, trend radar. We're worthwhile reading trends which are happening right now, which can be utilized in the supply chains as we speak, and things which are about to come. So definitely uh, one thing that I would like to uh, kind of put into your, uh, I guess, um, bedtime reading or any type of dis um, uh, things that you would like to kind of learn when it comes to logistics in the future. So I'd like to thank my esteemed guest here today, a very great uh, panel that we were able to put together. Thank you for your views um, and also sharing some of the stories of what's happening in the world of supply chain. Thank you so much and uh, we'll hopefully see you soon in one of the uh, up and coming features of this roundtable format. A huge thank you to everyone for taking part in that roundtable. There were some really great insightful discussions there that highlight the many opportunities and the challenges that supply chains are facing now and they're likely to continue to face in the future. Thanks to you for listening. I hope you found the episode different and interesting. Please subscribe if you'd like to hear more of the Ultimate Supply Chain podcast. And as always, please let us have your feedback and tell us the subjects you'd like us to cover in future episodes. Until then, bye for now.